Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis. I'm your host, Deacon Jonathan Stord, and I'm joined by Michael Osborne, who's going to be speaking to us about his new edition of the Most Holy Trinosophia. Trinosophia. Uh, hello, Michael. It's so awesome to have you here. Hi, thank you for having me, John. Uh, I often intro the show saying uh, I'm very excited about the guest and it's going to be an amazing show because we've done more than 200 of them and each time that is true. But I'm just trying not to say exactly the same thing for those regular listeners. But I'm very excited for this show because this this book, this text, which is not that well known, I came across it a couple of years ago in an edition that is that is definitely not as nice as yours. We're going to talk about that, that it's more than aesthetics, but it's it, it does grab you. There's something about this text that that I think people out there uh, who may not know it but have been similarly grabbed by a mysterious esoteric text, by visual art uh, from the alchemy tradition, people who just, when they were younger, glanced at a tarot deck and were sucked into it and don't know why, right? So if you've had that experience, then uh, I, I think you're going to find this show sort of sort of extra uh passionate because i really have this relation to this text and if you haven't had that experience well then you can buy uh michael's edition of the book and then you will get sucked in and then hopefully we'll all get enlightened reading the text but michael <laughs> enough of my ranting and, and i know that this is a, a a huge undertaking but can you can you give us a, a bit of an elevator speech about what this text is what is the most holy trinosophia okay um first of all that wasn't a rant john um it was a perfect introduction because it's all about grabbing the imagination and speaking to the subconscious and 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 connecting with other people actually on that level but um essentially the most holy trinisophia um, is a manuscript of the late 18th century it's written in french handwritten in french and it's comprised of 12 individual sections each of which is beautifully illustrated with um, a, an accompanying cover page. But there are also various vignettes and uh, ciphers and all sorts of other um, symbols incorporated into the body of the text as well as you go along. Um, it's, it was confiscated, um, as far as we're aware, there's one copy of the book. It was confiscated from the um, Count of Cagliostro. Um, during the Roman Inquisition in the year 1789. Um, it was found on his person. It was obviously very important to him um, individually. The book itself, though, the, the illustrations, their hand watercolour paintings. The book's essentially um, an hermetic manual, really, in the form of an allegorical initiation. It may, in fact, tie in more directly with the Egyptianized Freemasonry that the Count Cagliostro was heavily involved with, um, which which we can discuss in, in a little more detail later. Um, the text itself, there are um, a number of languages, some extinct, such as Chaldean and so on, um, actually embedded in the text as well as the usual suspects like Hebrew and Greek. Um, there, there, there are a lot of also jumbled up images, symbols, ciphers and things of that nature. And the author is very careful um, and very, um, is very careful and very um, uh, cunning really, I suppose, in the way that he hides the, the, the actual meaning of these um, um, ciphers and, um, and what they convey in the actual manuscript. So it's jumbled up is the best way I can describe it. And these um, images and letters, they will accompany um, the actual images themselves. Now, um, I believe that the text also has a much deeper meaning still. So moving away from any um, Egyptianized Masonic or, or even alchemical um, provenance or meaning to it. Um, I interpret it in a very Jungian way. So for me, the images, the colours in particular, um, read alongside with the text, um, do actually sort of communicate a much deeper subconscious um, 
uh, meaning, which does in fact have the power to raise one's sort of um, um, clairvoyance almost, actually, if you study and read them long enough. Now, the point being that the earlier versions of this book that were printed, uh, originally some 88 years ago, a man named Palmer Hall, they don't contain colour images. And the colour images you can find on the internet, they're not complete, and they're also grainy. Mm. And most of the books are very poor in the imagery. So it's a little like, if you like, a Skype, isn't it, where you can see and hear somebody, but you can't actually um, uh, touch or feel them or, or anything like that. So there's something missing in those books. It doesn't touch all of the senses in the same way that the full manuscript in colour does. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, as I was saying at the beginning, I, I had that experience myself. So I, I really think you're you're doing a real service with this this new edition. Uh, I understand that the original, uh, which of course is quite unique, because as you said, we just had the one copy, right? It's um, it's. It's distinctive physically. It's, it's shaped like a triangle and, and three and triangles, trino, this, this is important for the book, right? So even physically, this, this sort of triangular shape is important. Uh, no, you're confusing it with the triangular book of the Count, oh. the Count of Saint-Germain. Oh, okay, okay. And, uh, this is not the triangular book, John. Uh, <laughs> this, this is an Holy Trinisophia. Now, the, the triangular book is, is it's, it's, it's indir indirectly connected. Um, it's, it's ascribed to Saint Germain in the same way that the Trinisophia is ascribed to him. Whether or not he had a hand in it, we won't. We don't simply don't know. He may well have done. I mean, that is ascribed to him um, in in the in the Troy Library, but that's largely because of the bookseller's note, um, or, or rather some handwritten notes on the flyleaf of the manuscript, which said it was from his library and it belonged to him. And we know San Germain was really into Egyptianized uh, Freemasonry and met Cagliostro a number of times. And indeed, um, both men also met uh, Jean-Baptiste Villemus as well. Okay. Uh, and we know that the um, rectified Scottish Rite incorporates a lot of this symbology um in, in in its own archives it has similar symbology um but no the um the triangular book it's an entire it's written entirely in cipher uh -huh. i think gather it's been interpreted these days but it had an accompanying volume at one point whether or not it was ever whether or not anyone's ever found it or worked it out i don't know um but i'm aware of it i don't personally um hold a um a replica of it or anything like that but what i wanted to do with the trinisophia which is an ordinary shaped book mm -hmm. was to actually reproduce the manuscript as fully as possible so let me show you what it looked like yeah. this is the uh, the reproduction of it in here which contains literally every page including the front covers the spine and the tops top and bottom because I wanted to do that you see so what we did we commissioned the photographer at uh, the Troy Municipal Library to um, photograph the covers spine fly sheets and stuff that hadn't been done before so whilst they'd scanned um, the the actual manuscript had missed out a number of things some of the ciphers were missing at the back but they also hadn't done the covers they didn't think anyone was interested in that but they didn't count you, did they, John, or me? So uh, there we are. So it's a regular red Moroccan leather book. Okay, and I'll move it this way as well with the spine. Now, there are some interesting symbols and, um, and um, esoteric uh, things going on in the spine, but nothing remarkable. Um, and it has obviously gold leaf um, um, edges. And again, I also got them, the, the photographer at the library, to um, reproduce the back as well and, and the, um, the top and bottom of the top. Um, the previous thing being the, the sides or the side, I should say. OK, yeah. so there's there's the appearance of the book. But of course, um, when you get going in it, and this is the other thing that you see um, with the copies that are available online typically amazon or whatever it is where people go for these things such as us because that's how i got my first one they're transcriptions 
Now you can get a transcription in French if you dig around. You can get transcriptions in English. But what you don't have is the original French handwritten text that wasn't available unless you wanted to go onto the municipal library website and read the um, uploaded. But of course, the other thing about those was this is the quality of those images is quite poor because they were scanned back in the 90s and things have moved on quite a lot over the past 30 years. So we had the, the text and you can see it here if I move it closer. Mm -hmm. Okay, beautiful handwritten text. It's in very, it's in very good French, um, scholarly. He makes some mistakes, which might suggest that occasionally, perhaps the the author may have been an Italian or or, or a non-native speaker of French, which of course Cagliostro is known to have been. But not, but equally so as Saint Germain, um, if he came from Hungary, for instance. But anyway, it's lovely. It's in beautiful French. And there's several, several, several pages of this. But for the non-Francophone, what we've also done is translate it, pr provided a transcription in, in English, a translation at the back of the book, yeah. and duplicated the images. And it, it is, oh, sorry, and it is a do translation, right? Yes, yeah. But it, it wasn't a difficult one either, um, to be fair. So it's not like the lessons of Leon or anything like that. So, um, yes. So there's a new translation at the back with accompanying images for the English speaking reader. But if you're lucky enough to read French at this level, um, then you, obviously you've then got the actual uh, text and you can see there the illustrations that sort of creep into the text. Yeah. We have there um, obviously a vase. But of course, one of the things that always attracts me to that particular image, it also looks a little like a sarcophagus. Yeah. And the colours are alchemical. And the detail, just in that one vignette, actually, um, where are we? I'm struggling with this because it's a long way around. But um, you can see there, even in that little illustration, just the quality of the, of the detail. And of course, it's... Um, it's a watercolor illustration. They all are. Yeah, and in the uh, the the pre existing editions that people could buy, that would just be a, a black smudge. So uh, be a black <laughs> all that smudge. detail completely wiped out. And the frustrating thing about that, John, was that the the narrator refers to the colors and the images yeah. repeatedly in the text. So, okay. so you, you, you have sort of talked about this or, or explained this, but I, but I really want to tr draw it out and dwell on it for a moment about what really captured you about the book, because sort of my, and I've talked about this on the show before, but one of my introductions to, to, the, to the esoteric was just finding uh, Stuart Kaplan's uh, Dictionary of uh, Tarot and then a collection of, of uh, alchemical uh, uh, illustrations and just, yeah. you know, just sitting in the library and going through these, these wonderfully re, uh, reproduced artworks, uh, that have no explanations, right. That, yeah. that are, yeah. that, that are, they're just pure fuel for the unconscious. And, and also, you know, why this book, oh, you did mention alchemy and how there, there, there does, uh, of course, seem to be alchemical language, alchemical ideas in this text. But for those that don't know, there's, there's a long history of these mysterious alchemical tomes that tell a story and, and how have these entrancing, fascinating, uh, metaphorical, confusing, sometimes violent and sexy images. So, so why not one of those books over over this one? Why, why why did it really really grab you? Do you think? Well, it's not instant. Um, the thing about these illustrations, that, well, apart from the fact they tell a story, as the narrator either or both. Uh, passes through each chamber of initiation or each um, order or rank in, in his order, I should say, or, or alternatively, as the soul passes through each dimension on its journey through the halls of Ozir towards um, integration with God. That's the greater and more significant meaning of this book. Now, there cannot be um, a greater story to be told and to tune into than that search for the grail which essentially is what this is um now it's much older than its 18th century present uh, condition i mean this is an 18th century book 
but the themes, the motives in it are ancient indeed, and they speak to our subconscious. And like I said, with Jung, you had this idea of the collective subconscious that somehow we're born with a pre-programmed um, ability to perceive spiritual symbols and colours and and signs and the, and the subconscious is desperate to to interpret these and the the these these feelings they they rise to the surface and the conscious mind needs to uh, interpret those and that's what's happening there's this beautiful alchemical marriage between the subconscious and the con conscious going on when you look at these illustrations now it's not simply the case that it happens with this book it can happen with art and literature um, as you please. I mean, one of the example I've always had, I don't know if you've ever seen the Lohan in, in the British Museum. Um, there are, yeah, you have, yeah, there's three of them. Um, people have strange and numinous experiences when they stand in front of these, and I was one of them. Yeah. There was something about the color, let alone the sort of the intelligence that the artist has put into the eyes and face of this particular um, terracotta, uh, figure which really spoke to me and I found myself going back again and again and I mentioned that I think in my introduction to to the Trina Sophia because there is something very profound that happens to our subconscious when we consciously connect with these things and uh, um, remedying or repairing that disconnect I think is is essentially um, what it's all about I think that's if you like a core spiritual mission um the grail if you like is to find balance okay so when you look at the images for the trinosophia long enough if you have it next to your bed you dip into it every day the images alone the text is an added bonus but the images alone they will begin to work on your soul and soon enough you'll find yourself dreaming um You'll find yourself beginning perhaps to um, see things um, in everyday life around you that perhaps may at one point have been something you never noticed. OK, so um, for me, that's the that's the attraction of it, that that's that's what I, I get from it. And of course, then on the intellectual level, I'm fascinated by the the historical stuff going on with the allegorical initiation as well. And the connection between this text and the Egyptian books of the dead. Yeah. And uh, we're going to we're going to get into that shortly. But but coming to it's. You, we've mentioned a few times sort of its connections to, to the mysterious Kaliostra, the mysterious Saint Germain, and, and their mysterious uh, uh, Egyptianized form of Freemasonry. Yeah. Can you, I, I, and I think your connection that you make, other people have made it as well, but, but I, 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 I think that you're very insightful, very accurate in, in your connection of this text to, to Kaliostra's Egyptian rite. Can, can yeah. you give us just, you know, again, an elevator speech, an overview of what this rite was? And, and why do you think they or, or he made this book? And like, what did they make it for? What did they use it for in, in this rite? Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, I mean, um, the question of authorship is hotly disputed. Um, the majority of people won't need it to have been written by um, Saint Germain, and it may well have been. Um, he seems to have been a bit of a polymath, doesn't he? And, and um, I'm sure perfectly capable. I mean, he, he wrote letters to Villamuse giving him secret formulas for the dyeing of silks. He acted as a spy for the King of France and uh, was also an alchemist, a, a doctor and a musician. So I'm sure he'd have been capable of producing it. Um, however, um, the facts are it was found on Cagliostro's person and the facts are that if you read the um, narrator's introduction that's the first part of the book okay the first part of it um, you will see a highly autobiographical look into Cagliostro's life okay he's in prison he's been moaning um, the, the pride and hubris that led him there and the mistakes he made and the waste of his wonderful gifts. Um, Cagliostro, of course, decided to move from curing people and medicine to, to other um, ways of, of making an, an income. It was forced on him, really, because when you help people in that way, 
and you know it goes wrong there's no appreciation or they're constantly after your attention and that's what he found was the case but he regretted that i think and that's kind of almost um almost um shows in this introduction that the narrator is writing it's almost as if he's in the, the chambers of the, the Castel de San Leon. There he is in, in northern Italy, locked up. And somehow, as the narrator is saying, managing to write and draw by making his own ink, almost from nothing. And well, that's perfect alchemy, isn't it? If you can pull that one off. And of course, he, the narrator also describes how his body won't be found. He'll he'll simply disintegrate. And of course, that's the legend, isn't it, of Cagliostro? That he wasn't dumped in the shallow grave at the foot of the castle. He was actually he actually vanished. And none of us can say one way or the other which is true. Yeah. Um, now, I'm no expert on um, um, historic Freemasonry, and I don't set myself out as one. But I do know that the um, Egyptianized rite, um, what was it called? Um, I'm trying to think what it was called now. Um, the Egyptian, Egyptian Egyptian Masonic Order, forgive me, it was Egyptian Masonic Order. Um, it had um, a system where the lodge always included 12 brethren. Okay, there was 12 brethren in there. So... It was a little bit like the Illuminati, I think, in, in, in that sense. A slightly higher cor quorum, but there was 12 um, and no more. And it was governed by two masters as well. Now, if you think also that every lodge, these are the meetings, but every lodge had to have 72 apprentices, 24 companions and 12 masters. So you can see how the illustration and structure of this book around... Um, um, it's it's 12 chapter zodiac structure amongst other things actually fits in with that so you could argue and people do that's how they interpret it that's how manly hall interpreted it as um, essentially um, an initiatory uh, document so you would have if i just pick even one of the um one of the um pictures you, you'd have the the aspirant you see Mm -hmm. Here he is. I mean, any Freemason would, um, where are we, recognise um, the core principle or imagery there. And it could be that um, as people progress through that Egyptianized order, they were given the key or a copy of this um, um, to, 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 to memorise and learn which again ties in i'm afraid with the egyptian book of the dead because the um the, the priests and scribes similarly had to um learn um the the, the various hieroglyphs yeah. uh, and and images and live by them and that was another part of Cagliostro's order was its highly chivalrous and, and moral grounding and 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 the idea that the initiates would um um live by what they had learned as they were progressing through it i mean that's the core of freemasonry anyway ultimately however old it is i uh i, I think even today for you know there's probably lots of people watching and, and listening to the show who've never heard about this Cagliostro, and then probably a lot of people out there who have heard of him and still know it by his bad reputation even now he's uh kind of presented as a, as a charlatan as a as a quack as as a fraud and if people have heard of him that that's still how they think about him but if you actually engage with his work you actually read about his real biography if you uh, read some of his uh rights that he contributes to or recreations of the rights it's very profound it's, it's a very profound yeah. spiritual system that he put together yeah. very advanced yeah. very deep very rigorous very moral and in a true flowering of of the western esoteric uh, uh yeah. system in my in my mind yeah. so uh I, uh I i'm happy that he's he's it feels like he's been getting his his due and appreciation over the last uh uh last couple of decades i think people are starting to to appreciate him uh, uh even more just uh outside of a, a small circle of people so so we keep mentioning the the egyptian books of, of the dead uh, and i think that that's probably intriguing people. Uh, I, I think it's time we finally dive into it. But but there's a lot of parallels between 
this and and I'll say Egyptian books of the dead because sometimes there's there's a misunderstanding yeah. that it's just one text or it's kind of a yeah. family of texts. Yeah. And, and there's so many parallels that that's a big part of your introduction. But again, could you give us a broad overview and 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 tell us how the Egyptian books of the dead are really kind of a key to understanding the most holy Trinosophia? Well, they are, but it's essentially because it's a nomadic document. It's an hermetic manuscript. And of course, hermeticism um, arose in, in ancient Egypt and it was influenced by, by the Greeks and, and everybody else that sort of went there and then exported its ideas into the wider Roman world as well, uh, or indeed the Greek world of Alexander before the Romans even. Um, now, the, the key thing about these books of the dead is that there isn't a book of the dead as you say uh, they are um, a cultural phenomenon really where um, various spells and prayers and um, hieroglyphic images were written on papyrus typically um, and um, placed in coffins or the tombs of people who would then have the key because they'd understand and studied the ciphers the key to pass through each chamber or realm or world do at. And now the soul in ancient Egyptian, essentially, there are other levels, there's many different configurations of it. But essentially, if we think of it as the bar and the car, one, of course, is the uh, the car, which is the, the essence, if you like. We could say in the modern Jungian terminology, it's the subconscious. And then there's the bar, which is the personality soul, our conscious selves. Now at death, they're separated, but they're moments they are uh, momentarily or temporarily, I should say, reconnected um, when the soul resurrects to go through these various chambers of duat. All right. As it um, proceeds along and through the halls of Ozur on it on its way to its final judgment, the weighing of the heart ceremony. The Trinisophia exactly matches that journey. Okay, so that journey is going on for the narrator as he steps from the earthly, um, dark, black um, initial element of being underground through um, underground chambers and then through waters and and then trials of fire and baths of mercury and all these sorts of alchem wonderful alchemical symbolisms which of course derive from Egyptian hermeticism. So we have that um, and besides which there are um, recurring images and themes throughout the book and one of them is particularly important um, of the god Tote. Now, Tote is represented as an ibis bird, uh, the reason being it was black and white, um, and Tote was uh, both the god of, of, of the sun and, or a god, a god of the sun and moon, or night and day, life and death, of knowledge, as well as, of course, he's involved in the whole resurrection process, or journey of the soul as he accompanies it, for, accompanies it, accompanies it through the afterlife. Now, this um, bird, it's... Um, identified correctly by um, Palmer Hall um, as an ibis. You can see him there flying over there. That's one of our more important and profound images um, in the Most Holy Trinisophia. The ibis, of course, is holding a palm leaf. It's in our chemical colours. It hovers flightlessly above an altar, which requires no fuel to light its flame. And it's next to this torch. And you can see the Urubos snake wrapped around the torch. And there are these four highly cryptic um, um, messages, or ciphers um, around the actual image. And the text talks you through a large part of that, as you know. And the text does say in the following section, uh, which is this one here, um, again, um, so hold that up. Where, sorry about this, it's just the camera's the wrong way around, where you can see the Ankh mm -hmm. over a triangular altar. That's going back to your triangular book, which you thought this was, but you can see the connection. There it is. Um, and then we have these very profound symbols on top of the altar, including our friend the Ibis, who represents Tote. Now, on top of that, of course, 
um, you also have um, Seshat um, appearing in the book. Now, Seshat takes guises um, in, in various in various forms. Um, this is the, the final section of the book where, if you like, the bar and car or, and the male, female, the conscious, the subconscious, um, and all that sort of thing are, are, are reunited um, following um, their reintegration with God. There he is in, in the corner as the Philosopher's Stone, the symbol of the Philosopher's Stone. And you have the Uzia, the spirit of substance, and they're over the globe. Now, going back to this Ibis and that one that I showed you of him above flightless above the altar, it says in the book, actually, in the manuscript, the narrator says, or rather one of the wise men that he encounters says, if you grabbed these and understood them correctly, you would have fulfilled your mission. You'd have had nothing further to learn. So we know from that that the keys, if you like, to progressing through the afterlife are in this particular section. And that got my imagination going. I think it would get any esotericist imagination going if someone had said that to you. It's like, what is so special about that picture then? What do I need to know about that? And of course you can't understand it until you unlock all those images. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and that's that's part of, uh, I, I think, you know, why we're so fascinated by this text, uh, why everybody who's watching is going to buy a copy of your book and, and be so fascinated because it, it just keeps opening up, right? And through these different levels, once you have some of these, some of these keys. Yeah. Um, so, so to make something explicit, again, a thing that you've kind of touched on, but there's, there's these, these afterlife journeys, right? That, that you've been describing with, with the Egyptian books of the dead. And, people sort of started adapting this mythology uh both from egypt and around the mediterranean and around the hellenistic world to to say well yeah this is what happens when, when you die but actually you can you can use this this outline you could use this journey to to ascend and in this lifetime so it's both a, a right now and an after yeah. Absolutely. Uh, book, right and, and of Absolutely. course we can look at that in a Jungian way to as the Gnostics say the way up is the way down to to the way to ascend is to descend so this 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 ascension is, is also perhaps a an internal journey right um so, so, yeah, so yeah yeah can you tell us a little bit about this how this isn't just about the afterlife or it's not meant to be about the afterlife that that we are you know perhaps looking for a, a way to imaginatively or ritually uh journey uh to to these these quote unquote higher levels well i think there's always going to be an interest in that in human beings about whether or not there's an afterlife and what it's going to be like and whether there's a heaven and hell and we're going to be there or not or you believe in nothing but even then, you've still got this empirical process to grow to, to go through because you know, simply stating there's nothing, there's nothing beyond is is um, it's vacuous, isn't it? It doesn't really satisfy anything, particularly with with um, the, the evidence of afterlife that there appears to be. Um, so you have to ask yourself, though. Um, what sort of afterlife do you do you desire or, or, or look for if you can't make that progression in this life as well? And you're not going to be fit for purpose unless you do that. Now, one of the ways the Egyptians tried to get around that to some extent was to have spells and formulas that they could give to the gods to allow them to pass through each um, each chamber. But at the end of the day, for all their trickery, they still arrive at the Hall of Uzza and their hearts are weighed. And unless it was lighter than the feather, they were not permitted to go in. And whilst their, their car or essential essence would continue forever, immortally, their conscious selves would cease to be. So a second death, it would cease to be. Now this terrifying um, future of, of being in the sort of almost sort of unconscious continuity for eternity a bit like the greek hades isn't it or, or the hebrew shoal this terrifying prospect um was something the that the 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 egyptians were very concerned with as indeed are all cultures i think essentially and 
And one of the purposes of the Books of the Dead wasn't simply just to lock it up in your coffin or your tomb. It was to meditate and work on it during your lifetime and to apply its epithets so that your heart could be as light as possible um, when you die. So there is this sense, of course, of, of, of self-improvement, which comes through repetition and discipline. And any tradition has that, you know, um, the monastic hours, th those sorts of things where you develop this discipline um, through through repetition. And it does actually change your your behavior eventually. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure it does. Um you have this this wonderful quote in in the intro. Uh, Both the Trinosophia and the Book of the Dead reveal that inner knowledge is not so very different from ordinary knowledge. Can can you elaborate on that? I mean, it kind of connects to what you were just saying. But again, if we could, if we could tease that out further, it does because at the end of the day, however clever you think you are, however hard you look, the answer is always going to stare you in the face in the mirror. And around us in nature are the clues that we need. We're born, Louis Saint Martin said, man is born with the with the, the book of man in his hand, these mysterious 10 pages to understand everything that he needs to know. He just merely needs to remember that prior knowledge. And it's that remembrance of the prior knowledge that makes all the difference. So you don't need to particularly study um or, or or become an expert in 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 um, uh, esoteric or religious knowledge or 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 anything of the nature you know i mean go, fine you want to learn hebrew and, and greek and write the new testament if you want you know uh, write it out and parse it fine go ahead but it's at the end of the day you have the, the 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 keys around you already without these aids to understand God and yourself and your place in this system, in this sphere. The advantage, I suppose, of these texts and these books is A, the discipline that you need, and B, we all need a mentor. Everybody needs a mentor. I don't care if you're 110, you need a mentor right and it's arrogance to think otherwise now of course you might not be lucky enough to have one and your greatest mentor is always going to be your higher self okay um but for most of us we don't come into contact with that sort of um perception of ourselves it needs to be discovered and it takes a long time for a lot of people but um, we're not all naturals at this thing and i certainly not I'm 53 and I'm only just beginning to figure things out. So you get an idea, right? Um, but books and, and, and the scriptures and, and, and things of that nature, they are, they are our mentors, aren't they? They're our guides, unless we're lucky enough to find a real one, um, you know, a living person, then, then obviously that's, that's different. But like I say, ultimately at the end of the day, John, your, your highest mentor, your, your own temple, um is you you know you are the grand master of your own lodge you are the supreme sovereign of your of your order because you are it precisely yeah something i wanted to, to ask you about uh sorry i didn't put it on the question sheet because it, it, it did just occur to me uh when you were speaking earlier but i i do find sometimes a um a criticism or a cartoon of of Western esotericism's relationship to Egypt, particularly say Egyptian masonry, right? Is it's just people randomly grabbing this symbolism and a uh, few god names just to add uh, a little bit of exotic exoticism, a bit of a uh, pizzazz to their to their kooky rituals. But I I think you you probably obviously uh, uh, you see that that in this text there's there's a very deep understanding of of Egyptian, ancient Egyptian thought, and a, a deep understanding of some of the symbolism, right? Uh, symbolism that had, uh, that 
that was not really used in the West much after this period. So I, I'm wondering how you think this Egyptian knowledge sort of got to the, the early modern period, right? To to yeah. the uh, the 18th century. Now, I, I know that there's, there's lots of legends about secret brotherhoods passing on Egyptian secrets, uh, and, but I, I know that, of course, there's, there's cultural and archetypical ways for this for this knowledge yeah. to diffuse. So I'm kind of wondering what you yeah. what, 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 what you think about how how yeah. ancient Egypt ended up in in uh, uh, in this text. Well, you know, I agree with every word you've just said, um, uh, particularly with the sort of banal use of of quite sort of sacred imagery um, in in modern Rosicrucianism, particularly in the West, for instance, and and, and the like. Um, well, it's it's a it's a big point. Um, look, the Rosetta Stone. Incidentally, I think it was today or yesterday was the two hundredth anniversary of the Rosetta Stone's uh, discovery. Okay, Champollion uh, was the first to trans to do the bulk of the translation, and then Carl Lepsius completed his job. And it was Lepsius, of course, that coined the phrase "totem bush" or "book of the dead." So these two men. Um, Champollion Lepsius essentially translated the Rosetta Stone. So prior to that, there was a very imperfect understanding of G Egyptian symbolism, language and hieroglyphs and things of that nature. And yet there you have um, this, this manuscript in particular um, and, and, um, and even outside that, say Cagliostro's or Sancho Man's Egyptian right, incorporating some of these ideas. Now, um, a lot of Cagliostro's Egyptianized stuff is is really a bit, you know, it's, it's it's not particularly impressive. I think it's typical 18th century fare, if I'm honest with you, for the reasons you've given. Because you know you've got to put a bit of a show on to get people in and interested. Um, but there's something quite profound, isn't it? Because in the Most Holy Trinity Sophia. It's not overtly Egyptian. That's the point. It's almost hidden. It's codified like the ibis bird. Unless you knew about that, you knew the hieroglyphs, you would never know. That was a symbol for Tote or Seshat and her wand, of course, because this is the figure that appears interpreted as Isis at the beginning of the, in the second part of the book. Seshat is the goddess of, of knowledge. She's also the goddess of architects. Now, that sort of stuff wouldn't necessarily have been known or remembered at the time uh, that this book was 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 written. And here's the other thing. Cagliostro, going back to him, claims to have spent a large part of his earlier years, his childhood in Egypt, being taught the hermetic sciences. Now, uh, um, the debunkers laugh at that. Um, they, they they take the view, well, like, he's clearly Giuseppe Balsamo, the Sicilian fisherman. What does a man who caught pilchards in his youth know anything about this kind of knowledge? But of course, that's the whole arrogance that underlines the argument that Shakespeare is bacon, isn't it? And all that sort of thing. Unless you go to the right university or the right pedigree, in the case of Freemasonry, the right gongs, then you're not really qualified. Well, you know, you are actually because your soul is on absolute parity with everybody else's. Um, now, Cagliostro claimed this, and there may be some merit in it. There's no evidence he wasn't um, a high-born nobleman that ended up being raised in Egypt and Constantinople and moved around a bit. And if he was, he would have learned some of this stuff, perhaps from, from um, some sort of esoteric master in those places. Because there's a lot of Arabic in this book too. It's not just hieroglyphs, and there's Chaldean. So whoever's done it, whoever's done it, or group of people, of course, we assume it's one author. It could be, it could be a little group of people that have prepared this document um, for one reason or another. But they they seem to have a knowledge of of of. Um, of Egyptian hermeticism in particular, which predates what we should know. And that's what got my imagination for how on earth could that be? Um, and yes, you know, um, you just got to take your, your pick with um, Cagliostro actually. For my money personally, I think he's been poorly treated. And I think it's easy to lock up um, an esoteric master and say he's insane and dangerous and a magician and a threat to society and all those sorts of things 
uh, particularly if you're in 18th century um, Italy yeah. with the Inquisition, because they were talking about burning him to death still. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And they would have done. And then, and then, yeah, and they would have. It was, uh, yeah. uh, the, you know, it was, it was the Enlightenment, but at the same yeah. time. He just yeah. about saved his bacon on that one, didn't he? But, yeah. Yeah. Well, he was locked up, that's for sure. Well, I, I've been really getting a lot out of our conversation, as as I promised at the beginning. Um, I did forget to do our commercial for our Patreon. Uh, so before our final question, uh, folks, uh, patreon.com slash Gnostic, you can help us keep the show going for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month. We usually do, you know, four to six pieces of media. So that's four to six bucks. If you want to give us a buck, you can give us more. You can also put a cap on that. So you can say, hey, $5 a show, but max $10. I don't know. Uh, give us a buck if you can. Uh, if you can't, uh, we understand. These these are crazy times, folks. These are crazy times. <laughs> but you can help us out by telling people about the show, sharing it, like, and subscribing, all that stuff. Finally, one-time donations, paypal.me slash Gnostic. Okay, Michael, uh, I just wanted to... To wrap up on, do you feel that your interpretation of the images is, is definite, or are they sort of inherently archetypically able to generate their own storylines and meanings for people, or is there something else about it, the, the meaning, the interpretation, something in between? Can you tell us about that? Well, unless either of us are 18th century Egyptianized Freemasons, we're not going to necessarily know everything there is to know about this book and neither of us are i may look old enough but i'm not so they are individualized nowadays we live in the 21st century it's a new age and i think the, the even rudolf steiner talked about this is now the era of self-initiation okay so the old concepts of being initiated, um, raised by others, they are fast disappearing. The human mind, the human soul, no longer requires that to quite the same extent. So I can't say categorically if my theory about the connection in this manuscript and the Egyptian Book of the Dead is correct. I can, I can write a book about it, and I can say this is what I think. But I can tell you, that reading the text and the images will be transformative for you if you do it often enough. Um, and the reason for that is, is because it speaks to you on an individual basis and interpret it how you will. I think that's true of all esoteric symbolism. I don't think you really have to know the key, you see. Um, because you are the key. That's, that, I think, is, is, is the point. You need to have that transformation in your um, spirituality, your outset, the way you live your life now in this life, yes. Um, and that happens, it, you know, and, and I think these things are aids. They're really essentially aids, aren't they, to, to achieving that and no more. Exactly. Well, uh, uh, I'd love to. I, I, I could talk your ear off. Uh, just, the, my traditional ending for the show is, is is we could talk about this uh, until our tongues fell out. <laughs> we, we could keep going. There's so much more I would like to talk to you about and ask you about. But at the same time, we got to leave something for the folks at home uh, so that they will go out and get this book. Michael, tell them, where can they get this book? <laughs> well, it's available online, Barnes & Noble waterstones and of course through amazon and if you are looking forward for, uh, through amazon folks make sure you get the the mr osborne uh, edition so <laughs> just to be on the safe side um and uh yeah michael uh, it, it's been uh, awesome having you uh thanks for uh doing really a, a service to anybody who's interested in this stuff by taking this new edition out so uh goodbye to you and farewell to everybody at home yes Bye. thank you john thank you bye-bye